Chapter Three of the Boy Scouts in the Blue Ridge. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kenneth Sergeant Gagan. The Boy Scouts in the Blue Ridge by Herbert Carter. Chapter Three, in the Deserted Log Cabin. Keep your eyes about you, shouted Davy Jones. Maybe there's more where that stone came from. But after the rock had settled quietly in the road, silence again fell upon the scene. A little trickle of dirt glided down the face of the descent in the track the round rock had made. But that was all. Wow, that was pretty hefty stone, believe me, fellers, cried Stephen. Whatever loosened it, do you suppose, asked Giraffe who had jumped several feet when he heard the alarm given, for his recent adventure in the bed of the treacherous stream seemed to have unnerved the tall boy, usually as brave as the next scout. Thad stepped forward. The other saw him bend over the big rock that had just played such a queer trick, narrowly missing, falling among the gathered scouts. "'Look at that, Thad, would you?' exclaimed Stephen. "'Why, he's taken out of that crack in the rock,' Giraffe added, Say, it looks like a dirty piece of paper. And that's what it is, sure as shootin', fellers. Hey, a message from the enemy. Perhaps he's going to surrender unconditionally. Ain't that the way they always put it? Bumpus called out in high glee. Thad, however, after glancing down at the paper he had extracted from the crack in the rock, looked seriously. Evidently to him, at least, it was no laughing matter. What does she say, Thad? demanded Giraffe, always curious. "'Sure, if we got any right to know, read it out, Mr. Scoutmaster,' Bumpus echoed in his merry way, his eyes shining with eagerness. The scouts clustered around Thad as he once again held the scrap of soil paper up so he could see the comparatively few words scrawled upon it with a pencil. That must have been a mere stub, since evidently he had been frequently wet in order to make it do duty. It's brief and to the point. I give you my word, boys, he said. Here, let me hold it up, and every one of you can push in to read it for yourselves. The writer believes in making his words correspond with their sound. With that tip, you ought to be able to make it out. And this, then, was what they read as they bunched together on the mountain road running through the valley of the Smoky Range. Better take my advice and skip on out of here of the woods, the men here ain't got no use for you young'uns in these mountains. That's all. Savvy? There was no signature to the communication. Well, that's cool, to say the least, remarked Allen, after he had read the uncouth note that came down with a rock that fell from above. Tell us to turn around and go back, declared Giraffe, who was inclined to be peppery and a bit rash. Now, I like the nerve of this gent just as if we didn't have as much right to wander through these mountains and valleys as the next one. We're minding our own business, and I don't see how anybody would want to shoo us away from here, said Smithy, brushing off some imaginary specks of dust from his neat khaki uniform, always spick and span in comparison with that of Bumpus, for example, showing the marks of many a tumble. Thad was rather puzzled himself. He knew that it would be hardly wise for a parcel of boys to deliberately defy a notorious character as old Finn the Moonshiner, whom the government has never been able to capture. But then again there was a natural reluctance in his boyish heart to retreat, before making some sort of show with regard to carrying out their original design. Besides, when he happened to glance toward Bob White, and saw how crucially disappointed the southern boy looked, Thad immediately changed his mind. Still, he wanted to hear what his comrades thought about it, since they had gone a long way by the wise principle that majority rules. "'Shall we take this kind of advice and go back, boys?' he asked. A chorus of eager dissenting voices greeted his words. "'Not for Joseph, not if he knows it,' Graf chortled. We never turned back after we once placed our hand on the plow, remarked the pompous smithy, and his sentiment was cheered to the echo. Take a boat on it, Thad, advised the sagacious Allen, knowing that if trouble came along after they had decided to continue the advance, it would be just as well to point to the fact that by an overwhelming majority 
the patrol had decided upon this rash course. Every fellow held up his hand when Thad put the question as to whether they should continue the mountain hike, and the sad look vanished from the dark face of Bob White, as dew does before the morning sun. So the march was immediately resumed, and nothing happened to disturb the peace of mind or body. No more rocks came tumbling down the face of the mountain. And as the afternoon advanced, they found themselves getting deeper and deeper into the heart of the uplifts. Wow, but this is a lonesome place, all right, remarked Stephen, looking up at the lofty ridges flanking their course. I give you my word, for I hate to be caught out all nights alone in this gay neighborhood. If ever there was a spooky den, this is it, right here. Glad to have company, such as it is, fellers. No one took notice of the pretended slur. The fact was, the scouts no longer straggled along the road as before that incident of the falling rock. They seemed to feel a good deal like Stephen expressed it, that under the circumstances it was a good thing to have company. In Union there was strength, and eight boys can do a great deal toward buoying up another one's drooping courage. And say, Looks more like a storm come waltzing along than ever before, Bumpus observed, as he nodded his head toward the heavens, which were certainly looking pretty black about that time. Though I heard a grumble, like thunder off in the distance. Might have been that old Finn Daddy speaking his mind some more, remarked Draft. Only a little further and we'll come to an old abandoned log cabin, unless my calculations are wrong, which ought to serve for us uh, shelter tonight was the cheery news from Bob White, who was supposed to know this country like a book. Bully for the log cabin, ejaculated Bumpus, who, being heavy in bill, could not stand a long hike as well as some of the other fellows. The tall giraffe, for instance, whose long legs seemed just made for covering ground rapidly. Ten minutes later, Davy Jones, who had pushed to the van, gave a shout. There's your deserted log cabin, he remarked, pointing, and I'm correct, Bob. You surely are, replied the southerner, and as I failed to see smoke coming from the chimney at the back, it looks as to, to me, though nobody's got ahead of us there. If only the roof holds, we can laugh at the rain, believe me. When the scouts hurried up to the cabin, for there was no longer any doubt about the storm being close at hand, since lightning was flashing and the grumble of thunder had changed into a booming that grew louder with every peal, they found to their great satisfaction that it seemed to be in fair state of preservation, despite the fact that it must have been left to the sport of the elements for many a long year. Nothing wrong with this, boys, announced the scoutmaster, as they pushed inside the log cabin and looked around. And if we know half as much as we think we do, there'll be a pile of wood lying there before that rain drops down on us. Just remember that we've got a whole night ahead. Hurrah, that's the ticket. Get busy, everybody. We don't belong to the Beaver Patrol, but we can work just as well as if we did. Whoop her up, fellers. Bumpus was as good as his words. Dropping his haversack and stuff in a corner, he pushed out the door. Although the evening was being ushered in sooner than it might have been expected, owing to the swoop of the storm, there was still plenty of light to see where dry wood was to be picked up for the effort and immediately every one of the eight scouts was working furiously to bring in a good supply. No doubt the rattle of the thunder caused the boys to hurry things, for by the time the first drops began to fall, they had secured as much as they expected to use, and already there was Giraffe on his knees in front of the big fireplace that lay at the foot of the wide-throated chimney, whittling shavings with which to start a cheery blaze. They had just started when the rattle of a horse's hoofs came to the ears of the boys who had clustered at the door to witness the breaking of the summer storm. Hey, looks like another pilgrim overtaken by the gale, said Davy Jones, as a man on horseback came riding furiously along the wretched road, leading straight for the old cabin, as though he knew of its presence and might indeed have found it at shelter acceptable on other occasions. He was evidently greatly astonished to find the place already occupied by a bevy of boys dressed in khaki uniforms. At first Thad thought he could see an expression akin to fear upon the thin face of the man who seemed to be something above the average mountaineer, possibly a keeper of a country store among the mountains, 
or it might be a doctor, a lawyer, or a county surveyor, for he had rather a professional air about him. As the man, leaving his horse tied outside to take the rain as it came, pushed inside the cabin, Thad saw Bob White suddenly observe him with kindling eyes. Then, to his further surprise, he noticed that the southern boy drew the rim of his campaign hat further down over his eyes, as though to keep his face from being recognized by the newcomer. Another minute, and Bob had drawn the young scoutmaster aside to whisper in his ears a few words that aroused Thad's curiosity to the utmost. That's Reuben Sparks, the guardian of my little cousin Bertha, a cruel man who hates our whole family. He must not recognize me, or it might spoil one of my main objects in coming down here into the Blue Ridge Valleys. Warn the boys when you can, please, Thad, not to mention me only as Bob White. Oh, I wonder if this meeting is only an accident, or was guided by the hand of fate. End of chapter 3 Recording by Kenneth Sergeant Gagan